Two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads to on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The road not taken by Robert Frost is uh, a popular poem right now in graduation season. Often you only hear kind of the last couple lines, but the, I wanted us to hear the whole thing. It is an interesting thing uh, uh, about life, of the choices and the decisions. It's really obvious right now for graduates. That's why they kind of resonate with this. You know, there's always this kind of sense of graduation brings an ending, but it also brings a beginning. It brings other possibilities. It brings choices. It brings you to a place in the road where things will not remain the same, right? Life brings us to these places where we have a divide in the road, and a choice has to be made. I was uh, recently uh, just kind of thinking about my own life there. I, I was at a conference, so I was kind of tuned out, you know? <laughs> you, you start doodling there. And I, I don't know why. I just kind of started kind of, you know, outlining my life. And for my life, it kind of breaks down by where I've moved to because every move has kind of meant a, a major shift in kind of focus or whatnot with the different schools and moving to California, moving back here. And so I was just kind of outlining uh, those moves and, and reflecting back on kind of what those meant and, and uh, you know, what those different seasons were. I wonder how we handle these divides in the woods. These times where that choice has to be made, where something is going to, to kind of change and it's not going to remain the same. How do we kind of go about that? Oftentimes we don't like that season. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes there, there is, there's an excitement about it, right? There's excitement about something that's going to yet to come. So, you, the, you know, uh, I could remember graduating, different things of going, oh, these things are yet to come. But there was also a sadness of going, you know, I was really bummed to graduate school. I was like, I finally figured this thing out. I think I can run with this here for like another good five years, you know? Now all the rules are going to change and it's going to be completely different. And so there's always kind of this mixture of things. How do you handle the choosing seasons of your life? How have you? How do you? Oftentimes we kind of default to the mean and go, what I really want to find is just the nice, comfortable place where everything, I've got it just right and everything stays the same. Because life works out that well, really well, doesn't it? Come on, these are the jokes, folks, <laughs> right? Just the moment that you think you got it dialed in, something comes sideways and changes it, you know, invariably. And so we learn, we learn to kind of groove with it, with rolling with it. Or maybe, maybe you could do the Costanza principle. Take a look. Do we have Costanza principle? This is it. <laughs> ah, here we go. It's not working, Jerry. It's just not working. What is it that isn't working? Why did it all turn out like this for me? I had so much promise. 
I was personable. I was bright. Oh, maybe not academically speaking, but I was perceptive. I always know when someone's uncomfortable at a party. Don't happen over there. It all became very clear to me sitting out there today that every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's all been wrong. <laughs> Tuna, toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad on rye. Untoasted with a side of potato salad and a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna, because salmon swim against the current, and the tuna swim with it. Good for the tuna. Uh, George, you know, that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents... <laughs> Don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Yes. I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. <laughs> Victoria, hi. <laughs> all right, that's it, folks. Go with God. That's all you need to know. Everything you've done, just do the opposite. Sometimes it can feel that way in life, doesn't it? I'm just going, what I intended isn't working out. I, I thought I chose the right course and it didn't work out. And, you know, how do we kind of get there? And we, we can talk about how we make those decisions, how we make those choices, and going, you know, there's this type of calculation that we kind of figure out of being smart or being wise or being good or, or being right or wrong. Well, there's a story I really like. There was a, a man that had a son and a farm, and uh, one day the barn doors got left open and his only horse got out, and all the townspeople came out and said, oh... Sorry for your bad luck. He said, oh, how do you know? Well, a couple days later, his horse returned and brought with it a dozen other horses. And so everybody came out and said, oh, this is great fortune for you. How good luck for you. And he said, oh, how do you know? Well, his son took got busy and started breaking the horses and one of the wild horses bucked him off, fell on the ground and shattered his leg. The townspeople came out, oh, we're so sorry for your bad luck. And again, the farmer said, how do you know? Well, it just so happened that their country has been invaded by another country and all the young men were being shipped off to war, but his son was spared because of the shattered leg. How do you know? Is that good fortune, bad fortune? Is this a calculation of decisions of going, boy, we've got to, you know, we'll, we'll see how this turns out. You know, but when does the story kind of end? How do we know that we kind of do that bottom line calculation to go, yeah, this is good or this is bad or it really kind of comes down to, well, how long can I keep it kind of good? How long can I keep it bad? How can you, we really make decisions about this? Does it feel like just a 
do what you want? It's just a gamble? Well, our world tells us, well, don't do what people say. You just do what you want to do. Or do what is the unlikely thing. Isn't that what Robert Frost is kind of getting at? I took the road less traveled, and that one made all the difference. If, if I don't follow the crowd and I kind of go my own way, that's the way that that works out. Oh, how do you know? To help us along with this, I want to look at a peculiar passage of Scripture in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the story of the early church, and it's not just kind of a history book. It's kind of a guide for us, for all the generations of churches to look back and go, uh, how did God begin to work through his church? It doesn't tell us everything that God wants to do, but it starts laying some groundwork. Well, there's an interesting story about halfway through. Paul has been converted to Christianity, uh, and he's turned into a missionary. He's going, hey, I'm going to spread the gospel. Well, the church had a bit of a problem with uh, some issues. They were still trying to figure some things out. They called all their missionaries back, all the leaders. They made a big decision and said, okay, now we got to kind of get this to all the, all the churches. And so they sent them out. It's Paul's second missionary journey. He's starting to head out. And it says that... Uh, uh, then they went from town to town, him and his companions, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. Paul's been given a job. He's going out and doing stuff. He's spreading the word of the council and what this decision is. He's doing what he's kind of told to do. Maybe, maybe that's the right course of it. And it does say in the next verse that the churches are strengthened and encouraged by that. But it's the next part that gets really interesting. It says, as he's kind of going through, next Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Now, Mary's been teaching us a lot about the Holy Spirit, and she hasn't covered the part where the Holy Spirit stops people from preaching the gospel. But that's clearly what we've got right here, doesn't it? I mean, this is a line that doesn't make sense. Did we read that wrong? But indeed, the Holy Spirit prevented them from preaching the word. Paul is going, well, I'm on a job by my boss to go spread this decision, but he also has this kind of internal gut going, I have a second act in life. I am, I am to preach the word. I'm a, a servant of God. I'm going out. And here the Holy Spirit gets right up in his grill and says, not here. Not here. Now, I didn't put any map up here. So just to kind of imagine, he started in Jerusalem. That's where the council was. And he's heading back west, kind of going back towards Greece. As he's wandering through Asia Minor, they're talking about he can't go south. Now, south is important cities. We have letters to those, those churches like Ephesus. And we hear about Laodicea. Yeah, that too. Uh, to the south, he can't get there. The, these are established churches. Paul is prevented from doing the thing that he feels called and passionate to do. And so they, they kind of continue on. They try to go north. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of ben 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 that. They're going to the Black Sea. This is an important port. They want to kind of get to people who like to be around water. So they go, if we can't go south, we're going to go north. They're using the Costanza principle. Do the, come on, folks. These are the jokes. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. We're going to have to have a board meeting with God. What are you doing? Come on. This is Paul's passion. How dare you tell Paul he can't do what he's passionate to do? This is the mission. How can you tell Paul not to be on mission and doing this? It's decisions that don't make sense. Paul had a plan. He had a job to do, get this word out. He had a mission, get the word out. And we have in this small little paragraph here where God goes, no, no, not there. I know that makes sense to you. All right, come over here. No, no, not there. Not, not yet. Not the right time. Just keep going. And 
if we saw this on the map, it would be kind of don't go south, don't go north. They just kind of continue through the mountains. They come to the Aegean Sea. And so they go all the way to the seaport of Troas, which doesn't mean much to us. But he's just kind of walking between this. And I, I suspect that if we could really kind of map his steps, it would be almost kind of going this way and that way. What's interesting is that Luke doesn't provide us any details about how this happens. I mean, did they have a vision? Did they have a bad stomach ache? Did they run into trouble and they interpret it as God is redirecting them? We don't know. All we know is that at the conclusion of this, they really understood whatever guided their steps, taking them away from the logical path, taking them away from what they expected, taking them away from what they wanted to do, they saw God behind it, saying, okay. We're going to go this route. So they get to Troas. They're on the uh, uh, Aegean Sea. It says, that night, how about it? That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia, that's just across the Aegean Sea, that's in Greece, above Greece. Macedonia, northern Greece, was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us here. How about that? When did he get the vision? When he wasn't allowed to go north or not allowed to go south? No. He was bordered up. He was brought to choices to go. I'm going to kind of, he could have resisted God, right? No, south makes sense to me. North makes sense to me. That's where I'm going to go. But he listened. And in obedience, then he got direction. Come over here. This is where God has for you next. This is Luke writing, So we decided to leave for Macedonian at once. How about that? One of the tricky things here about making choices in life is there is a divide in the wood I don't know. We, you could break it down into a lot of different ways of going, well, the road less traveled, the, Lord lo, the, the road more traveled, you know, and, and we could have a, a, a bunch of different distinctions. But as Christians, I think there is a divide in the road. Uh, not the divide of right and wrong. There, we, we, we could divide it that way. But this divide of how I approach the life ahead of me. Do I, I'm out of order with my slides, do you seek God's blessing for your plans? I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to decide what's right. And then God, you make sure it happens okay. And God is good when he comes through. He's bad or just a little shaky. I'm a little bit hurt that he didn't deliver on making my plans work. That's a dangerous road. There's another road, the right road, that will make all the difference where we do not seek just his blessing, but we seek his path. The difference between these is, you know, we might want to say, well, we seek God for this, and it's hard because it's not always as clear as this where, well, I, don't, I can't go south, I can't go north. But in ways that we kind of figure out, man, God is leading me somewhere. We can even approach that the wrong way of going, God, you show me what you're thinking. I'll see if I agree with it. And then I get to vote yes or no. Right? Nah, I don't think you have that quite right. I think I'm going to go back to plan, my plan A here, and you better bless me, because that's your job. Paul doesn't go, hmm, Macedonia, I don't know if that's a really great plan. I think we should go back. As soon as Paul knows it's from the Lord, he goes at once. The disposition of a follower of Christ is... I know the one that I'm following. I may not always know the plan. I'm not going to get the plan in advance all the time. 
but I know the one that I'm following, and as soon as it is made clear, I go. At once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach there. Graduation is just a time that we kind of, for those people, to really kind of see, yeah, we come to choices in the road. And you know what? There's no neutral response. To just stand there at the road is a choice unto itself. God is always calling us forward. It is how do you go forward? I know best. May God bless me. Or like Paul, going, I've got a plan. I've got a schedule. It's not like we just kind of wander through life, but willing to be stopped, willing to be directed. And as soon as I have clarity, I go. That's what it is to be a follower. I want to invite Mary up here. She's got a good story, a good example in her own life, how this has played out for her. Yeah, I had lived more than 30 years in Rochester, New York, and I had a comfortable life. Owned a home, my daughter was in school, had a good marriage, everything seemed to be going right, and then my husband lost his job, and the economy in Rochester was not great. And so try as he might, he couldn't find a job. And so we made the trek to Central Florida because there was a plethora of jobs, we were told, available there. And so we moved to Orlando and instantly loved it. Do you see? Rochester, New York, Orlando, Florida. Do you see the difference? (laughs) (laughs) We thought it was great. We loved it got settled in there, and I had no idea that a year later, my husband would suffer a fatal heart attack, and I would lose him. I had no idea. I didn't know what to do. And a family member said, well, why don't you go to school and get a degree doing what you're doing for free in your church? So I thought about it, and I felt That was the direction God wanted me to go. And so I went to school, and I was years old. And (laughs) uh, most of my students were younger than my socks. So that was a real challenge for me. (laughs) And so I went to school, and I really didn't know what I was going to do with that. Um, But God started to even that out for me and to explain it was going to be teaching so I thought it was going to be teaching in schools and no that wasn't what it was he wanted me to preach and that was terrifying Um, but he started me out very gently as a children's minister and so I had positions as children's ministers and then um, pastors I served started seeing bigger calls in my life and they started mentoring me toward bigger positions and So I just kept following where God was leading. And then I felt God saying that the denomination I was in was not the right one for me. And I had been there 15 years. That was a hard decision. And so I just kind of wandered for a while. And someone invited me into their Free Methodist Fellowship. And I went to the Free Methodist Fellowship and loved it and decided that was where God wanted me. And so I followed him into there. And who knew? that he was going to call me to a little church in central Pennsylvania. I was happy in Florida. I liked life in Florida. I was comfortable. I had good friends. But he was calling me to this church in central Pennsylvania, so I followed him. And I came here, and it's been a great experience. I've had new challenges to face, um, And I've had all kinds of different personalities to learn to work with. (laughs) (laughs) And God has stretched me and challenged me and grown me to places I never thought that I would ever go. But he's stretching me further now. And so on Tuesday, I accepted a call to a church as its lead pastor in Buffalo, New York, 
And before you say anything, I know it's north, <laughs> and I know it snows there. I've heard every one of the jokes, please. I know that. But I also know God has called me there. This has been confirmed over and over again. And it started in January when our superintendent called me and asked if I had ever considered whether or not I was ready to be a lead pastor. And I was honest with him, and I told him, yes, but I think I need to stay in this church and get them to the new building first. And so he kind of talked with me about that and said, well, this is not uncommon for someone to leave in the middle of a building process or, or shortly thereafter. I'd like you to talk to Pastor Noel about that. And so I did. And I told Noel, this is what I'm feeling, but I think God wants me, God would have me stay here until we get to the new building. And Noel, in his very gentle way, said, <laughs> no, no. I don't want you to just take any position, but if God has called you to a church, we will release you. And he has. He's called me to this church, and he has released me. And so at the end of June or in the beginning of July, I will be transitioning as, to a spot as a lead pastor in a church in Buffalo. Uh, I'm not telling the name because that church is not announcing it. They've given us the grace to announce to our congregation first. Um, but I want to thank you for giving me grace to adapt and to grow and to continue and be released to do what I feel God calling me to do. All right, that's the official version. Here's the real true background story. I'm not surprised by this at all. You don't know how many times she comes storming into the office. Is it going to be this hot this long? Why did it snow more? I said, why didn't you move? Why don't you move to Buffalo? So she is. And that's, that's the true story. And I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> From the first moment that we met uh, Mary, I remember in our interviews, we understood right from the very start she was leadership material, lead pastor material, even then. Uh, so I knew this day would come. And this is a good thing, a good blessing, because it is the kingdom path. We may go, wow, there's a benefit to stay and keep it the same. But God is always opening up doorways and wanting to do more work than what we may imagine at any one time. And so we're not losing Mary. We are releasing Mary. We are sending her out so that the kingdom will grow, so that we'll multiply this. And uh, we get to celebrate her victories because she's been part of us, and this is going to give her the room to run and do all of uh, her leading that God has instilled and gifted her with. What we've gained is the benefit of having this level of a pastor for three, four years at a critical stage. There's no way that we would see this on the, on the hilltop without Mary here. Wouldn't have happened. It would have broke me. It would have. We needed, we needed the right thing at the right time. It was Mary. And so we're going to trust God that this is the right time for Mary because he's confirmed it. And we're going to believe that God has got us. He has faithfully provided every step of the way. As long as I've been here, and I'm sure well before that, uh, I can give testimony to that. And so we don't need to worry or be concerned. God, If God has ordered this, he's got the next thing in line and in place uh, for both places. So, Mary, thank you so much for being here and being staticky. <laughs> so I want to say one other word. This is deep in the tradition of free Methodism. Uh, we, our founder, right from the very start, said women are called to pastor. Our people didn't get it. 
the, the rest of the denomination said no. And he died before he saw their minds changed. It took 50 years. Do you know what happened in 50 years? The undeniable experience of watching women work in ministry, not at lead pastor, because they weren't allowed, but in planning churches, leading small groups, starting initiatives. And after 50 years, the rest of the denomination went, oh man, God, God really is at work in them, and they made a cataclysmic change. We don't do this because the culture has thought this. We thought it long before the culture did. Uh, it has been proven by experience that God is at equally at work and works through men and women together. And so this is right and good and our privilege to send Mary out as a lead pastor, uh, knowing that the Holy Spirit is going to guide her in that church. So that's who we are. Thank you. Yeah. How do you face the divide in the road? You can work out your calculations, or you can say, I believe in the one who guides. Maybe it makes sense, but it doesn't always have to. We follow the one, we trust him, that he knows best. That's what we do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are so good. That you pursue us, you win us, and then you get us into the game. You give us guidance and direction for the mission for our good. Father, help our wandering hearts at times, our wandering minds that want to have it our way, but to grab hold and see your good plans and know that you're leading us forward. 